Fidel Castro, revolutionary, prime minister, president, elder statesman, remembering the Cuban leader for almost half a century. Hello, I'm Arnold Naidu, and this is The Heat. Cuba is mourning its longtime leader Fidel Castro, who died last Friday at age 90. He was an iconic figure on the world stage for decades, and he dominated politics in his native Cuba since coming to power after leading a socialist revolution in 1959. Cubans will be paying their respects to him over the next several days. And as Cuba and the world reflect on Fidel Castro's extraordinary life and career, we begin with CCTV's Michael Voss, who joins us from Havana. And Michael, now that Cubans have had a few days to reflect on the passing of their longtime leader, Fidel Castro, what's the mood there and how are people responding? And um, the mood here remains somber, sad, um, subdued, very much as it has been right through the weekend, ever since the news that Fidel Castro had died. The one change now is, though, that the official tributes have begun in Revolution Square, that location where many times Fidel Castro gave those fiery speeches that could last for hours. Now the Cuban public is lining up for hours on end to pay their respects. The, the lines for, started forming around 4.30, well before dawn. Now it's dusk. They're still there in their tens of thousands. Uh, Fidel Castro's urn is not there. His ashes are not at this monument. Instead, everyone is filing past a large portrait of him, of the young Fidel, the revolutionary in the Sierra Maestra Mountains. It's surrounded by flowers with an honor guard. Now, it is the passing of an era, and I think that a lot of circumspension now about what comes next. What does it mean without Fidel Castro at the helm? Okay, he's been out of power for now 10 years. He had to step down for, for, for ill health. But remember, the majority of Cubans were born after the revolution. And, and they've all grown up knowing with, with this larger-than-life, charismatic Fidel Castro, really much a dominant part, a central part of their lives, even after he was taken ill and stepped down. Now they're going to contemplate about what happens next Fidel, do the reforms speed up? Does, does Raul Castro become slightly more, more, more um, forward-looking and, 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 and speed up the reforms? Although now with Donald Trump in the White House, there's a lot of uncertainty about what the future holds for Cuba without Fidel and with a new president in the White House. Thanks, Michael. That's CCTV's Michael Voss reporting from Havana. Fidel Castro had a major impact not just in Cuba, but also in developing countries from Latin America to Africa. What were his major accomplishments and what does the future hold for Cuba now that he's gone? For perspective and all that, I talked with the former Cuban diplomat and educator Carlos Alzugaray. Thanks for joining us, sir. Thank you. Thanks for having me. You were a teenager when Fidel Castro came to power in 1959. What kind of change radical change did he achieve in Cuba, particularly in the final years of the revolution? Well, I think the, the, the main thing is, first, Cuba became independent for the first time in its history. Cuba was never independent, independent on the United States. The United States decided things in Cuba. So with Fidel, we started to decide by ourselves. And uh, that was very significant. But not only that, Fidel carried a foreign policy that made Cuba a very important, important actor in international politics as a, a contributor to cooperation in public health, a contributor of cooperation for the end of apartheid, for the end of colonialism in Africa. I think he uh, deserves the merit of having taken Cuba that way. The other big merit of, of, of Fidel is having transformed Cuban society into a better society, a society more egalitarian, more just, more fair, and a society where the levels of education and the levels of public health uh, significant. Uh, he was not able to achieve 
uh, Cuba's economic independence. That was a big, a big problem. Uh, he was not the only person to blame for that. I mean, he carried out foreign economic policies that had as, per, as the purpose the betterment of the Cuban people. Some policies uh, were um, didn't, didn't work precisely because Cuba had to undergo through his time, uh, uh, through his life, two major economic upheavals, the, the imposition of the American embargo or blockade or economic sanctions on Cuba, which turned the Cuban economy upside down in the 1960s, and then the end of the Soviet Union, which meant the loss of 70% of its foreign trade. Nevertheless, Cuba uh, survived, the system survived. So I think these are his two main achievements that have to be recognized by anyone who judges him objectively. The U.S. embargo, of course, in place for more than 50 years. If that embargo had not been in place, how much more could Fidel Castro have achieved in Cuba? Oh, I uh, hadn't existed. We, we could have done much better economically. We could have achieved the idea of diversification of our external economic relations. I mean, Fidel never said that he didn't want a uh, to the United States. As a matter of fact, when he visited the United States, in April 1959, he said he would welcome American tourists, American investment, but with the only condition of respect for Cuba. If that would have happened, who knows? We might have three million American visitors every year. We might have uh, important investment from companies that would contribute to the development of Cuba. What we didn't want was a repeat of the past in which American foreign companies, including the Mafia, by the way, uh, exerted a total influence over Cuba and corrupted the Cuban political system. So uh, uh, if, if Cuba, if the United States would have accepted what Fidel proposed, that was a fair deal, that we had a normal relationship with the acceptance of the changes that were taken in Cuba, I think we would be much better off. He had some very fierce critics, none more so than Cuban exiles who live in the United States. Uh, how did he view those critics, and was there ever a time when he thought that the criticism that was leveled against him could in some way be justified? Well, re remember that he faced not only the criticism, but the actual assassination attempts against his life organized by the CIA and with the cooperation with the Mafia. Uh, so the exiles, uh, uh, those who you call the exiles, which actually are right now a very small minority of the Cuban-American community in the United States, the exiles took a hard line on Cuba. They were supported by the United States. They were used by the United States at the beginning. The Bay of Pigs was a classic example of the exiles being used by the United States in their regime change policy towards Cuba. So the exiles have been, the, these older exiles have been always unhappy with the fact that they made the wrong choice. They left Cuba under the assumption that uh, the United States would, would get rid of Fidel Castro and they would return back here to the old Cuba. That didn't happen. That makes them very, very unhappy. Fidel, I think, made everything possible to have a dialogue. In the 1970s, he started a dialogue with uh, those, uh, those part of the exiled community who wanted to have a dialogue. Unfortunately, at the time, the reaction of the hardliners was to attack the, those people who were interested in a dialogue, which is a civilized world to go, uh, called, they called them the dialogueros. It was a dirty word to be in favor of dialogue. It's very surprising. And then some, even, some people even were, uh, acts of terrorism were committed against people who had a position of the dialogue with the Cuban government, which again, I would say, it's a civilized way to go. Let's talk. Let's find out where we can agree and what we can do. Uh, I think Fidel was always ready for that dialogue. But remember, uh, the, Cuban, the American government threw against Fidel practically everything in the book, except the direct military intervention. How important was Fidel Castro to uh, progressive political movements around the world, uh, left-wing movements, if I could put it that way? One thinks about the role that Cuba played in the end of apartheid in South Africa, as you mentioned just a moment ago, or the fact that Cuban troops actually were in Angola when that country was granted independence by Portugal. Well, I have, I have, as a diplomat, I have worked in many underdeveloped countries, in Africa, in Latin America, uh, in Asia, and everywhere I find admiration for Fidel Castro. Remember, Fidel Castro came into the limelight of world public opinion in the 60s when all these uh, 
big leaders of the third world like Jawaharlal Nehru uh, from India, Bafon from Ghana, uh, Ahmed Ben Bella from Algeria, Sekou Touré from Guinea, uh, Gamal Abdel Nasser from Egypt. He was equated with these big leaders of the third world. It was the origin of the third world. The third world became active in international politics and Fidel played a very significant role. He was universally admired by by the people, by, by these leaders, they consider him part of, these, uh, of the leadership of the third world that wanted to have peace and not be manipulated by uh, the two superpowers, but especially by the United States. He was perceived, uh, perceived as the David that was facing the Goliath and that he was successive. Uh, he was successful in doing that, very successful. He visited China, of course, and China continues to have very cl close relations with Cuba. Uh, what sort of relationship did he have with China's leadership? I think the relationship with China's leadership, especially in the last few years, there, there, there were at some point in time their differences, but those differences were overcome because China and Cuba have common interests. They have common interests in a world not dominated by the United States, not dominated by multinational corporations. Uh, China and Cuba coincide in a number of political issues. Plus, China has become an economic superpower, and uh, in, 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 in a situation like the one that Cuba has, well, it makes very much sense as good as a relationship in economic and political terms with China. And uh, I would say that China is the most significant strategic ally of, the, of Cuba in the last few years. And, and, and the relationship goes beyond even economics and politics. Chinese kids come to Cuba to, to learn Spanish. Uh, Cuban kids go to uh, China to learn Chinese. Uh, there is a lot of respect. Remember, these are two third world revolutions who face the same problems, who had the same origin, a long guerrilla war in the case of China, a shorter guerrilla war in the case of Cuba. And these are leaders who reached power after a long struggle for the independence of their countries and for the uh, social uh, betterment of their society. So uh, there is a lot of common things between the Chinese and the Cuban leadership, and specifically with Fidel Castro. And what kind of a legacy does he leave in Latin America? He was very close to people like Hugo Chavez of Venezuela, Daniel Ortega of Nicaragua. His main concern was one to make Latin America united and more autonomous from the power of the United States. And you're seeing that right now, the constitution of CELAC, uh, the constitution of ALBA, which has a joint idea of Fidel and, and Chavez. All these things are due to his preaching. He was preaching that Latin America should stay united, that Latin America should work with each other beyond ideological differences. Uh, there is a tendency to look at Fidel only from a left-wing perspective. But I think that if you look at Cuban foreign policy in Latin America and the Caribbean, what you're going to see is that the capacity of Cuba to have a dialogue with all the political forces in Latin America. So it's, it's only normal that people in Latin America look to Fidel as one of the great liberators of the continent in the last uh, 50 years. Will his revolution survive him? Uh, could we see now instability in Cuba, perhaps a return to no, no, I, I don't see that happening. I see, first you have to take into account that he has had a wonderful successor in Raul Castro. Raul Castro, uh, who everybody in the past saw in the shadow of his brother. Now you see the statesman that is inside Raul Castro. Raul Castro has been able to follow uh, the lead that Fidel Castro established, especially in terms of um, the, uh, the unity and independence of Latin America. Uh, so I don't see that as a big problem. At, at the same time, Raul is working on the transformation of Cuba towards what one would call the post-historic or the, the post-legendary uh, post, uh, period, the period of the heroes, the heroes of the revolution, which Fidel and Raul represent so well. Well, biologically, they would they will exit the stage, and a new generation of Cuban leaders is going to come. And this generation was educated on the, on the Cuba, in the Cuba that Fidel founded, 
they are a result of that process. They are better educated. They are people who look forward. They are people who look for the unity of Latin America and the Caribbean. And, and this, 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 should, this, should, this should guarantee that we will go forward. Of course, uh, nobody can rule Cuba like Fidel and Raul Castro have ruled Cuba. Okay, Dr. Carlos Alzugaray Traitor, thanks for joining us, sir. Joining me now from Beijing is Chinese international relations expert Victor Ga, and with me here in the studio is Brian Berker. He's the author of Imperialism in the 21st Century, and he's also executive director of the Answer Coalition. Welcome to both of you to the show. Brian, let me start with you. Fidel Castro had been out of office for several years uh, when he died, but he still exerted enormous influence in the country, even after he handed power to his brother, Raul Castro. Uh, he's dead now. It's the end of an era. What does it mean for Cuba? Well, I think Cuba's had the, the benefit of the fact that there was a 10-year period in which Fidel uh, retired as the head of state. Uh, in historic revolutionary leaders, when there's a sudden departure of that leader, whether it was Lenin in Russia after the Russian Revolution or Mao Zedong in China, usually there's a period of turbulence and factional struggle. Uh, this decade of smooth transition has allowed the Cubans to carefully plan the transition. There is the continuity of the historic, as uh, Hugo mentioned, and Raul is there and other leaders from the Cuban Revolution. But there is a new tier, a new generation of Cuban revolutionary leaders. They were not participants in the 1959 revolution, but they are very devoted to the cause of the Cuban Revolution, to the cause of Latin American unity, to the cause of socialism. Uh, they, they are there. They are ready to take over. This will be uh, Raul Castro's last term in office, and he's made it clear that when he leaves, the next generation comes, and there, in fact, will be term limits. So there will be change, but I think overall there will be continuity. And you can see on the part of the Cuban people, millions are coming out. You can't force people to come and show grief. Uh, that shows that Cuba by Donald Trump or the American political elites or the mainstream media, that it's just a tyranny, a terrible nightmare. Uh, that's not how the Cuban f people feel. They see the benefits of their revolution. Uh, getting back to what you said about the old guard and uh, Fidel Castro, the people who were with him during the revolution, the times when he was in power, will they be seeing him very differently from the new generation? Um, well, I think the people who fought in the Revolutionary War cannot be um, identified in the same way with any other generation. Uh, they were there putting their lives on the line with no guarantee of success. And then against all odds, they recreated and reorganized Cuban society. The people who are coming now are there because of their technological prowess, their intelligence, their training. They haven't been tested in the same way in terms of combat. Uh, combat makes a big difference in, in terms of the, the leadership, the organic leadership of a country that emerges from colonialism. We saw that even in the American Revolution. We see that in all revolutions. Uh, but I think what, what the Cubans have done, because the party has maintained a stability and has had right. this period of transition, I think it will be uh, something where the next generation is ready to take over and will take over in the same spirit as the last generation. Right. Let's bring in Hugo Cancio. He is a Cuban-American entrepreneur. He was born in Cuba. He does business with Cuba. Hugo, welcome to the show. Uh, saying goodbye Thank to their longtime leader. Uh, what are you hearing? What are they saying to you? How are they remembering him? Look, uh, people are very calm and very respectful. Uh, people are just mourning the death of uh, one of the most uh, influential and controversial leader of this century. Uh, their leader, the man which uh, this, you know, two generations uh, were brought, brought, uh, born under his umbrella, under his government, under his guidance. So the people are, you know, extremely respectful, mourning his death. Uh, and some people are actually feeling it, our heart, the death of, uh, of Fidel Castro. Victor, when Castro's death was announced, the Chinese president, Xi Jinping, remembered him, and I'm quoting here, as a great person of our era who'd made immortal historical achievements for the development of world socialism. What was the relationship like between Castro and the Chinese leadership through the years that he ran Cuba? The passing away of Fidel Castro is not only a passing away of a person and a leader, but truly a passing away of a historical era. Uh, between China and Cuba, in more recent decades, uh, there has been great friendship and goodwill and high level of cooperation. Uh, on the other hand, in the late 1960s and uh, throughout 1970s, 
there were bumps in China-Cuban relations, mainly because at that time, China and the former Soviet Union were against each other. There was a split of ideology between Moscow and Beijing, and Fidel Castro chose to side by the former Soviet Union. And that caused uh, freezing uh, of relations between China and uh, Cuba. Fortunately, uh, after China started to embark on reform and opening to the outside world, especially since the 1990s and after Fidel Castro's uh, historic visit to China in the early 1990s, relations bounced back between China and Cuba. And now we all mourn the passing away of Fidel Castro and we truly believe Fidel Castro was not only a legendary leader, but he was a household name here in China. Most of us actually grew up by thinking of Castro as a truly international leader, not only a leader of Cuba. And he has demonstrated his courage and vision and wisdom by standing firmly up against the United States, proving that the U.S. will and all the sanctions levied against Cuba eventually failed. And in that sense, I think, the proclamation of independence of Cuba, but also standing firm on its own ground, proved that Fidel Castro will always be remembered as an exceptional and outstanding and courageous leader uh, in the Latin American countries, but also throughout the world, especially in the emerging developing countries. Hugo Cancio, take us back to the time when uh, Fidel Castro launched this revolution that changed Cuba, changed the world in many respects. He came from a relatively privileged background, so what was it that drove him to launch this revolution? Where did the revolutionary zeal, the fire, come from? Well, listen, at the time, uh, in, 19, in the 1950s, there was racism and segregation, social injustices going on in this country. The Cuban economy uh, was in the hands of American business and American interests. There was a lot of discontent among the, among the Cuban, uh, um, you know, the, the, among all Cubans, uh, the Batista government, the Batista regime was a dictatorship. So, you know, all this student movement, Fidel Castro came out as one of their leaders and decided to change the course of history, decided to confront, uh, you know, a, a, a government that was a dictatorship, that was abusing his people, decided, and his ideas were ideas the majority of the Cuban people approved and supported. Uh, evidence of that is when he marched into Havana in 19, January 1st, 1959, the majority of the Cuban people, including some of the people that are now are living in exile, uh, were part Part of his, you know, uh, were supporters of, uh, of his movement, of his revolutionary movement. So he transformed the history of Cuba and, in essence, the history of, of all revolutionary movement around, around Latin America and in many countries around the world. We were, we, back in those days, there were a lot of injustices and there were American imperialism, as they call it here, uh, dominating the world and especially in Central and South America. So Fidel uh, became an icon. Fidel became a world figure. F Fidel changed the course of Cuban history forever. Brian, if we fast forward to the last year, President Obama here in the United States took steps to normalize uh, relations with Cuba, restore diplomatic relations, um, and that is still going on today. How was that seen by Fidel Castro? Well, Fidel was, as you could see in his comment after President Obama was able to speak to the Cuban people, he was making it clear that the Cuban people, while wanting normalized relations with the United States, we're not going to be dictated to Obama or anyone else. He made it very crystal clear that uh, he, the Cuban people were not going to take crumbs from someone else's table. Uh, we have to remember Cuba has done so much. 10% of its national budget is devoted to education. It has a literacy that's compared to 2% of America's national budget. The Cubans have 99% literacy. The Cubans have universal health care. They've done so much to, to take doctors around the world. Cuba has an outsized role in world politics. So Cuba is not going to be on its knees in front of any, anyone. President Obama recognized that the blockade and the hostility towards Cuba had not isolated Cuba. It had isolated the United States in Latin America. And so he said the old policy doesn't work. So after 54 years, let's reopen embassies in Havana and Washington. But right now you have President-elect Donald Trump coming in. You see his rhetoric, his maligning rhetoric after Fidel's death. He said the terrible, brutal dictator has died firing squads, a life of tyranny and poverty, the deprivation of human rights. I mean, this is the talk of the Cold War. So the Cubans, even though they know that there could be the possibility of good neighborly relations with the United States, they also know that those policies could be undone as they may be being undone by the new president-elect. So Cuba is going to ultimately be self-dependent, self, -dependent, self 
uh, reliant and independent and not hoping to uh, be on the American gravy train. So I think the Cuban pride, the Cuban strength, uh, its resilience will make a big difference right now. Victor, Fidel Castro and Cuba had a huge impact on the developing world. Cuba under Castro uh, played a key role in the post-colonial wars in southern Africa against apartheid in South Africa. Uh, the fight for independence in Angola, as uh, Professor al mentioned in the first part of the program. What's your assessment of the impact he had in the developing world? Uh, first of all, uh, Cuba, under the leadership of Fidel Castro, exercised a disproportionately larger impact on global affairs than the size of its economy or the size of its population uh, would have uh, allowed Cubans to exercise. And in that sense, I think it's largely due to the outstanding leadership of Fidel Castro. Fidel Castro was truly an inspiration, and not only to the Cuban people, but also to many, many people throughout the world. In China, for example, uh, I, among many others, uh, grew up by uh, learning about Fidel Castro, uh, understanding him as a leader, and reading about all the legendary stories about him and the Cuban Revolution. And we really got very inspired by such an outstanding leader and great leader, especially when we thought about Cuba being so close to the United States. And the United States throughout these decades has been menacing against the Cuban. And I think you just now mentioned that under President Obama, the relations between Cuba and the United States were starting to normalize. And it's, I think, a recognition of the victory of the Cuban people right. and the Cuban government, rather than uh, it was the work of any sanctions imposed uh, by the United States. And this, again, demonstrated in a very explicit manner that the world is diversified. There is not just one version of the okay. truth. And the United States cannot bully other countries, especially its immediate neighbor, Cuba. And I think this really is very inspiring to... Uh, people throughout the world, All right. in many uh, countries. Ugo, I've just got 30 seconds left. Uh, what about the impact Fidel Castro had in Latin America? Uh, look, it's it's a huge impact. We just we were witness of the uh, trees, uh, uh, trees, uh, the, the the treaty between uh, the Colombian government and the and the guerrilla. Uh, Fidel Castro has his hands all over it. It was under his guidance. Uh, I mean, the impact is huge. Uh, he spread, you know, his revolutionary right. movement, uh, unjustice uh, movement to to abolish some justice, uh, you know, to pro promote free education, free health care. I mean, right. Fidel Castro. Um, it's, it's, it's a Latin American icon, okay. it's a world icon. He dominated the headlines over, you know, a decade. Okay. A decade. Hugo Kensio, Brian Becker, Victor Gart, thanks to all of you for joining us. That's it for this edition of The Heat. We'd love to hear from you. Send us your questions, comments, story ideas to The Heat at cctv-america.com. We'd like to continue the conversation on social media. Give us your thoughts and comments on our Facebook page. That's at CCTV America. I'm Arnold Naidu in Washington, D.C. Thanks for being with us.